Thank you for the quietness of this moment. Holy Spirit, thank you for coming our way. We would ask as we would continue to worship you that you would move among our hearts. Holy Spirit, we are able to give a decent performance, whether that would be through music, songs, or even for that matter through speaking and teaching the gospel. But how foolish of us to think that anything would penetrate anyone's heart if you did not come into our midst. Thank you for being here. Continue to work through your word. In Jesus' name, amen. We left off the last time in this series. It's a new day. We talked about our families. I want to continue talking about our families. A new day for our families. How do we subtract our painful experiences from our children? How do we avoid handing them down and handing them out? How can my hurts be healed? As a parent, regardless of how terrible my yesterday may have been, how can I be sure that my family will have a new day? Your family's new day rests greatly upon two letters. No, not two words, even though they do mean and have words, but two letters. What is your PQ as a parent? Write those two letters down. What is your PQ as a parent? Most are familiar with IQ, intelligence quotient. Some of us are familiar with EQ, emotional quotient. But what is this PQ? Here it is. You probably already know, but it's our persistence quotient. Our persistence quotient, our PQ. I read in a standardized math test, Japanese children consistently scored higher than their American counterparts. Researchers have discovered that it has more to do with effort than ability. In one study, first graders were given a difficult puzzle to solve. The researchers weren't interested in their ability to solve it. They wanted to see how long they would try before they gave up. The American children lasted an average of 9.4 minutes. The Japanese children lasted 13.9 minutes. In other words, the Japanese children tried about 40% longer. A group of professors from Berlin Academy of Music did a study with musicians, uh, in particular children violinists. They divided children, violinists, into three groups. What they considered to be excellent violinists, good violinists, and those unlikely to play professionally. They started playing at the same age. By the time they were 21, regardless of the class they started in, the elite performers had logged 10,000 hours of practice time. Now, this doesn't devalue skill, but it does assure even if skill is lacking, we can accomplish greatness if we are persistent at working at it. Neurologist Daniel Leviton writes, and I quote, the emerging picture from this studies, uh, from such studies is that 10,000 hours of practice is required to achieve the level of mastery associated with being a world-class expert in anything. In study after study of composers, basketball players, fiction writers, ice skaters, concert pianists, chess players, and even master criminals, 
10,000 hours of practice is required to achieve true mastery. He says, no one has found a case in which world-class expertise was accomplished in less time, which means PQ, persistent quoting, has greater impact on our future than IQ. Turn to your neighbor and say, you know what? We can do anything we want to do if we are persistent enough. Amen? Amen. I know you'll have a hard time remembering that. But we can do anything that we want to do if we are persistent enough. While this is true in general, it is doubly true in God's economy. When it comes to healthy families, there is no shortcuts, no substitutes for persistent parents. We are battling on every front an extremely persistent evil that is out to destroy family as we know it and as God designed it. We must take our place and boldly lead our families according to God's righteous intent. God designed for a man and a woman to enter into a loving relationship of marriage. And out of this union, he intended for children to be born. And when male and female are blessed with children, the parents are to raise them in the fear and the admonition of the Lord. And those of you parents that are doing that, you know that it takes enormous persistence because you're battling on every front. In fact, about four weeks ago, about a month ago, when I, just, uh, when I first came back, I was, having, I was sitting at a table and I was having a conversation with, some parent, with, the, with a parent, dad and a mom, two parents. And here's the words that came out of them, their mouth. And they have, I don't know, he's probably 11-year-old and, and, uh, and then they have an older daughter. But here's the words that come out of their mouth. We get so tired of battling everywhere we go for good and what God wants for our children. Listen very closely. Listen very closely. Persistence can win the day. Persistence can win the day. Husband and wife must be persistent to remain as one, working through challenges and adversity in marriage. There's where it begins. Persistence in parenting our children begins with persistence in our relationship with our spouses. Parents must be persistent to set godly examples and insist on righteous principles for living. And parents must be persistent and intentional not to pass on to their, to their children unfulfilled dreams and not to pass down their unhealed hurts. God has designed marriage and family And there are voices that are saying otherwise. But we must be persistent to lovingly yet firmly resist those voices. So how is it that we are able to keep from passing down our hurts to our children? Here we go. I gave it to you last week, but let's elaborate it on this week. Confess your hurts, number one. Confess your hurts. Whoever suggested that we should not talk about our hurt with others has ignored the wisdom of God's word. Here is one example that we'll look at today. 17-year-old Joseph is sold as a slave by his brothers. He serves as a slave in Egypt. While there for the next 17 years, about those many years, he is lied on and he is lied to. He is betrayed by his friends. He is accused of rape and he is unjustly incarcerated. Yet in spite of his setbacks, God sets him up in a high public position in the Egyptian government. As we jump ahead a few years, there is a severe famine in the land, and through circumstance of events, his brothers come to Egypt to buy corn. In Genesis chapter 45, turn there and follow along. Beginning with the first verse, Then Joseph could no longer control himself before all of the attendants, and he cried out, Have everyone leave my presence. So there was no one with Joseph when he made himself known to his brothers, the nine that sold him into slavery. And he wept so loudly that the Egyptians heard him, and Pharaoh's household heard about it. 
he wept deeply. Joseph said to his brothers, I am Joseph. Is my father still living? But his brothers were not able to answer because they were terrified at his presence. Then Joseph said to his brothers, come close to me. When they had done so, he said, I am your brother Joseph, the one you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here because it was to save lives with and God that sent me ahead of you. Now, here's what I want you to notice. Joseph says to his brothers, you sold me into slavery. In other words, I want to talk about what happened. Not only does he talk about his hurts, but he talks to the people that hurt him, his nine brothers. And he says to them, you sold me into slavery. You see, it must be therapeutic and helpful to talk about our hurts because people pay anywhere from $90 to $150 an hour to be able to talk about their hurts, and some of them pay more than that. Have you ever noticed <clears throat> when we describe our closest friends, always it is mentioned something on the form of they are easy to talk to or uh, they are, I, I feel comfortable in talking with them. That is interesting, huh? Why is that? Because my friend, let's be very honest, there is times that we are hurt and we really do need to talk about our hurts. If we want to keep from passing our hurt down to our children, talk about them with a trusted adult. When people want to talk to you about their hurt, it is not the advice that you give that matters most. It's the trusted ear who listens that don't repeat. It's the question you ask, listen closely, and not the answers you have. Here's what I'm learning. As a friend, you want to ask these questions. Here they are. There's three, and you want to write them down. What happened? And by the way, this is not original uh, with me. This came from uh, a Christian counselor. What happened? What did you learn and what are you going to do with it, meaning what you learned? Now, I want to say those questions again because when people come to you and they want to talk about their hurts, they're going to have a lot of things to say, but you're hurt their friend and you want to ask three questions and keep asking those questions. What happened? What did you learn? And what are you going to do with it? In other words... For their whys and whos and whens and hows, your question is what? Now listen closely. Don't miss this. Those three what questions not only help us work through our hurt, it helps us to find and follow God's plan for our life, and that inevitably helps us work through our hurt. Don't miss that. So what's the significance of the what questions? In fact, I would encourage you to, uh, to, to try to direct to stay away from when and who and why and how. But focus on what. What's the purpose of those what questions? What happened? What did you learn? And what are you going to do with what you learned? You already know Joseph told his brother what happened. You sold me into slavery. That's what happened to me. As we go through the rest of his story, we'll find out Joseph told them what he learned and what he was going to do with it. That's very crucial. That's very, very important. What did you learn through this experience that hurts you? Now, here is my fear. Here is my fear. My fear is that we will go through hell and not be more like heaven by going through it. Because we did not learn and we have no plan for what we're going to do with what we learned. We can, we, we can talk about what happened, but we got to sometime or another, we got to say, but what did I learn from this? What was God teaching me through this? 
And I'm telling you, I'm telling you, when you talk about what happened and when you're able to talk about what God taught you and you are able to articulate a plan, a purpose for what God taught you, you're able to articulate what you're going to do with it, I'm telling you, healing begins to happen quickly. You need to talk about your hurts with that trusted adult. I don't suggest that you... uh, are all of that to everybody, but you need to talk about your hurts. Talk about what happened, what you've learned, and what you're going to do with it. The second one, write this down. These three things that will help us to heal our hurts, and I'm sure you already know this because I gave it to you last week. Forgive your hurters. No doubt one of the greatest challenges of a Christ follower is forgive the people who hurt us. We are told repeatedly in Scripture to forgive others because we have been forgiven by God. Working through forgiving the people who hurt us is an enormous task, but with it comes monumental healing. This is crucial, which enables us to avoid passing it down. Let me tell you, if you've been healed from it, you won't pass it down. Amen. Look at Genesis chapter 45. You're already there. And uh, pick up in the sixth verse. Let me read the fifth one again. And now do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. For two years now there has been famine in the land and for the next five years there will not be plowing and reaping. But God sent me ahead of you to preserve you a remnant on earth and to save your lives by a great deliverance. So then, it was not you who sent me here, but God. He made me father to Pharaoh, lord of his entire household, and ruler of all of Egypt. There is two phrases that I want you to see here. For it was not you that sent me here, but God. And then back up in the fifth verse. Now, do not be distressed and do not be angry with yourselves for selling me here because it was to save lives that God sent me ahead of you. Let's talk about this. This is powerful if we can grasp it. No doubt, as I said, the greatest challenge is to forgive. Joseph says to his brothers, I forgive you because you were instrumental in bringing about what has been brought about. Joseph looks at much of the good in his life presently and realizes while his brothers meant to harm him, they actually helped him to get there. Only God can take the harm others meant and get us to a better place in life. Now, listen very closely. Don't miss this. The hurt of others may put us in a bad place, but I'm telling you, God takes the hurt of others and puts us in a better place. You say, that's the case with Joseph. No, 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 no. That's the case with me and you. For we know that all things work together for good to them that love God and are called according to his purpose. I'm telling you, if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, others meant to hurt you and bring harm, and it puts you in a bad place But you follow Jesus, and I promise you, he will use it to take you to a better place. You see, only God, only God can manage that. If others maliciously intended to put you in a bad place, look to God, trust him, and he'll use it to take you to a better place. God uses, oh, come on now, God uses the setback from others to set us up to fulfill his purpose in our lives and in his world. Somebody should say amen. Listen to Genesis chapter 50. Turn over there. Here we go. Excuse me. Verse 18. Now, uh, Jacob has passed. Joseph's father has passed. And uh, so they've taken him back to bury him in Canaan's land. And his brothers become very, very uneasy because they're fearful that because dad is now gone, that Joseph will retaliate. Now listen very closely. Listen very closely. Forgiveness does not retaliate. Even when it's convenient. Oh, my, 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 my. 
Let me tell you something. If you have a convenient moment and you want to retaliate against the people that hurt you or the person that hurt you, you may want to get back on the cross. Amen. You may want to come back and say, dear God, I need your healing. Watch, watch what happens here. Here we go, verse 18. His brothers then came and threw themselves down before him. We are your slaves, they said. And again, you can read the, uh, those uh, verse 15, 16, and 17. It just kind of recaps. I just recap what it said. But Joseph said to them, don't be afraid. Oh, listen, 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 listen. I am in the place of God. You intended to harm me, but God intended for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. So don't be afraid. I will provide for you and your children. And he reassured them and he spoke kindly to them. Now watch this. Yes, Christ followers get hurt. But really, can you hurt Christ followers? Think about it. Yes, Christ's followers get hurt. But really, can you hurt Christ's followers? Interesting. Yesterday's hurt helps prepare the platform that you will stand on tomorrow for your God. People hurt us with the intent to stop us. But when Jesus is our Lord, they always aid. Their hurt always aid the plan of God to move us ahead. And I read the verse for you in Romans 8, 28. You see, if we live for ourselves, focusing on what evolves in our own small little world, there probably is no value in our hurt. However, if we live for Christ's purpose, our personal hurt is helping us uh, purpose, uh, is helping his purpose, I should say, for his world and for our living. Let me tell you, let me remind you, write it down. The devil's setbacks are only God's setups. Write it down and remember it. Has people hurt you? Sure they have. But we can forgive them because our God uses their hurt to help bring about his purpose, his plan for our lives in this world. So what happened to Joseph? Okay, they sold him into slavery. He was falsely accused and incarcerated. What did he learn? He learned the ugly stuff that others threw at him was God's material used to build the platform for his amazing performance nationally. And that's exactly what he did with what he learned. He became and was the savior of a nation. What happened to you? What did you learn? What are you going to do with it? Listen closely. We can not only forgive our hurters, but someday... And I would say right now, we can thank God for using them. And you will see where God used them to bring about his plan for your life and his purpose for his world. We will not thank them for what they did, but we will thank God for in spite of what they did, God uses it to better his world and bless our lives. As Joseph says, they meant it for evil, but God meant it for good. As it turns out, what Joseph's brothers did to him brought about him being in Egypt, preserving the nation of Israel during a severe famine. We can forgive our herders because as God's children, there is always a God cause clause. Write that down. You can forgive your herders because Jesus forgave you. That's incentive enough. But let me give you a bonus of why you and I can forgive our herders. It's because there is always a God cause clause. In your hurt and pain and adversity, God's cause clause is soon to go into effect. Joseph said, God sent me to Egypt. You nine brothers assisted in me getting here. He was doing the devil's work, but God caused it to work his plan for my life and his people. I know you've heard the story, but it just so uh, uh, appropriately fits here. Let me tell you this story about this lady in West Virginia, and I think she was Kim Humphrey's neighbor. 
You remember it? You've heard it. Oh, yeah, you've heard it. And, and it's an old story, but, but let me just repeat the story because it just, I think it fits appropriately. Is, is this dear saintly sister in West Virginia who was, 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 very, was very poor and, and had very little, and, and, and she lived next door to an atheist. Now, now Kim wasn't the atheist, okay? Kim lived on the other side of this sister that lived in West Virginia. Uh, she lived next door to this atheist, this agnostic, and, and, and he was always making fun because she is a praying saint. And so she was, she was just crying out to God and saying, God, I need groceries in the house, and, 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 and we need, I need food. And, 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 uh, and, and the neighbor heard it, and so he went and bought the groceries and put it on the front porch. And she come out, and she seen them groceries, and she just went into a shouting spell. Oh, my goodness. She was praising God and thanking God, and that arrogant, agnostic neighbor, atheist, come over and said, Oh, shut up. God didn't provide that for you. I went to uh, save a lot and bought those groceries for you. God didn't do that. And she just elevated her praise and her worship and her shout, and she said, God provided, and he made the devil pay for it. Amen. Well, I want to tell you something. I know you'd heard it. Thanks for bearing with me for a rerun. I want to tell you something. You listen very closely. The devil may have meant it for evil, but God brought good from it because there is a God cause clause in your pain. Listen, in 2 Kings chapter 6, the Bible says God caused the Syrians to hear an army when there was no army to be heard. I want you to hear this, and you can read it. It's a great story. God caused the Syrian army to hear an army when there was no army to be heard. There was only four lepers that was within a country mile of the Syrian camp. So how did they hear an army after them? It is what I would call a God cause clause. Amen. You want to do an interesting read in the Bible, in the entire Bible, I hope you're up for a year. But just take a red pen or take a highlighter and go through your Bible. Uh, probably more Old Testament than New Testament, but certainly uh, the Old Testament. And just peruse through or just do a Google, just search it. I mean, man, just uh, get a concord. But go through and underline, and God caused this. God caused it to rain, huh? When there was, uh, we could go on and we could go on and we could go on. I'm telling you, there is a God cause clause in your hurt and in your pain. God caused Joseph to be in Egypt. And that's what Joseph learned. And he realized with what he had learned, he realized he was going to do something with it. How terrible for us to waste our painful experiences and not learn from them, but even worse, not do something as a result of those. In 2 Chronicles 20, the Bible says that God caused an ambush against the enemies of Judah when Judah did not even attempt an ambush in their military maneuver. Interesting. That wasn't even their maneuver. In fact, they were just singing. And while they were singing, God caused an ambush. The same God that caused an ambush to the Moabites and the Ammonites and Mount Seir against Judah. The same God that caused them to them an ambush. The, the, the same God that caused the entire Syrian army to hear an army coming after them when there was no army to be heard. The same God who has that God cause clause for them has a God cause clause for you. It hurts now, but wait till the God cause clause goes into effect. Oh my goodness. Go ahead and forgive your herders, because I'm telling you this morning, there is a God cause clause in your hurt and your pain and your adversity. I wonder what God is going to cause to come from your hurt. Whatever God causes will be good. Hang on, because every good and perfect gift, James writes, comes down from the Father. Number three, follow the healer. Uh, go back to Genesis 49, and I'll pick up in verse 9. Hurry back to my father and say to him, this is what your son Joseph says. God sent, uh, um, 
God has made me Lord all of, of all of Egypt. Come down to me, don't delay. You shall live in the region of Goshen and be near me. Underline the region of Goshen. You and your children and grandchildren, your flocks and your herds, all of you, all that you have, I'll provide for you there because five years of famine are still to come. Otherwise, you and your household and all who belong to it uh, will become destitute. You can see for yourselves, and so can my brother Benjamin, that is, uh, it is really I who am speaking to you. Tell my father about all the honor accorded uh, me in Egypt and about everything you have seen and bring my father here quickly. Now, Joseph urged them to make haste and follow his directives. Bring my father, bring all your family near me, bring them to the land of Goshen. Here, Joseph says that he would provide for them and here he says that he would protect them. You see, Goshen was a region in Egypt designated for the people of God, Israel, to live. God had a place for his people to live in a foreign land. God has a Goshen for his people today. It is not a geographical location on a map. It is a relational intimacy with his son, Jesus Christ. That's our Goshen. God has designated for his people who are living in this sinful world, a foreign land, to live near his son, Jesus Christ. How do we live near his son? We live near him by living like him. By following close to Jesus, you are assured the Father's provision. By following close to Jesus, you are assured the Father's protection. Hurt hurts, but when the Father is protecting you, his protection softens the blow. Yes, hurt hurts, but the Father's provision enhances our healing. In other words, if, it weren't if you weren't following close to Jesus, it would have been a lot worse. I want you to know that God loves you this morning, and there is no exceptions. His son Jesus Christ died to forgive you. By accepting him by faith, he promises you a life with him forever. By following him, he gives you an, an abundant life now. Gang, I want to say this, and I want you to hear it. This stuff works now. Yes, I want to live for Jesus so I can go to heaven when I die and not hell. But I want to tell you something. I want to live for Jesus and you want to live for Jesus because this stuff works now when you follow him. I have people to say things like this and you have as well. Maybe you've even said it. You know, I tried the church thing. Stop. Whoa. Hold on. It does us no good to try the church thing without falling deeply in love with the Jesus thing. And I'm telling you, it is in following him that we experience protection and we experience provision. And I want to say to you today, if you will follow him, he'll give you an abundant life. And out of that abundance is the, is the fact that there is a God cause clause in your hurt and your pain. And wait till the clause kicks in. Because you will see, while they meant it for evil, God meant it for good. And while they intended it to set you back, God is using it to set you up. And that, my friend, only God can do. And only in following his son can we experience the richness of those promises. Heavenly Father, in Jesus' name, could we come to you today? Perhaps today we need to begin our journey. Or for some of us, we need to renew our journey. If there is anyone among us who is not following you, may we begin. If there are those among us who are doing the church thing but not the Jesus thing, may they renew their commitment. May they begin anew their commitment to follow you, Jesus. I thank you. I thank you that we do not have to pass our pain down to the next generation. We, it stops with us. You can heal us by us confessing our hurts, forgiving our hurters, and following our healer. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's stand.